Welcome to Politics Done Right, coming from the studios of KPFT 90.1 FM, Houston, your community radio station. We have a great program for you today. Pastor Stephen Brown on progressives and the black community, all or nothing infrastructure bills. Today, we're going to have an intriguing conversation. I enjoyed speaking with Pastor Stephen Brown, even as it saddened me that a person with such a platform and raw intellect has the potential to cause such harm. Broden said he has studied and researched and come to the conclusion that there is a deliberate attempt by the liberal left and progressive movement used to use the black community as a hammer against the system. He said... They have seduced the black community into supporting their agenda because they framed their agenda around issues important to black folks. He continued that they duped blacks and deceived them into supporting progressives. They use blacks voting power to seize power in the government and they make policies to advance their agenda. We were duped, deceived and manipulated into supporting them, the pastor said. They have never supported our issues. I think the pastor is wrong. Specifically, uh, he speaks from a position of dependency. The progressive movement is owned by no one. It is owned by us all. I think his position is that of subservience. Listen to the entire interview. My goal was not to confront, but nudge him with the expectations that the listener got the real point of the discourse. Anyhow, folks, we also discuss the issue of the infrastructure bills. Should we allow just the bipartisan bill to go through with the possibility that the $3.5 trillion human infrastructure bill is left to wane? Absolutely not. This is one time that we must ensure progressives must come together and say once and for all, I think we've taken enough, enough of saying the next time we'll get ours, the next time we'll get ours. So no, it's all or nothing. All right, folks, uh, let's go ahead and talk about being in fun drive mode. We have a great show for you today. This, This is the only time I'm going to give this fun drive message and at the end. So please listen up. I beg that you support us however you can. We have several offers for you. My first book, As I See It, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right-Wing Doom. You can get that for an offer of $120. My second book, It's Worth It, How to Talk to Your Right-Wing Relatives, Friends, and Neighbors. Uh, Another offer for $120. My third book, How to Make America Utopia, Take Away the Economy from Those Who Rigged It. Another pledge, $120. You can get two, any of those two books for $200 or any of, well, or the three books for a pledge of $250. Remember, you don't have to pay this all at once. You can itemize it. You can do as you please, but please support us by getting one of these offers. Or if you will, just support us by becoming a member for uh, $40 uh, for the year, I believe, and all the different offers that we have. Just go to kpft.org org kpft.org to support the, pro- the the program or call 713-526-5738. You can get Politics Done Right Mondays through Fridays on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash politics done right or on YouTube Live at politics done right.com slash YouTube. Please do not forget to follow me on Twitter for updates. You can reach me at at Egberto Willis, at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. But before we get started, please remember to keep your community radio station KPFT in your minds. Talk about it. Tell your friends about it. Tune in to 90.1 FM Houston or listen at kpft.org. Likewise, keep our 100,000 watt station that uh, station that covers the entire Southeast Texas on air and help us get that backup generator. Again, please make a contribution by getting one of those offers or 
by just going to kpft.org and getting something else. Look, this station is here for you. This is your station. Please support your station. If there's any doubt whatsoever why it is imperative that going forward, Democrats in the House do not pass a bipartisan bill until the human infrastructure bill, the $3.5 trillion bill is passed. This particular interview give a perfect example as how weak, weak Democrats have a tendency to acquiesce to the fallacy, acquiesce to the false notions of an economy working for just a few. Or, in effect, they support an economy that will just work for a few. I want you to listen to this, and then we'll take it on the other side. Consumer prices soared 5.4% in July compared to this time last year. That's the same number we saw in June, which was the highest jump since the Great Recession. This comes after the Senate passed the bipartisan infrastructure deal with 19 Republicans joining all Democrats. And overnight, Senate Democrats passed their budget resolution without any Republicans, moving quickly to get another three and a half trillion bucks in new spending passed in their second proposal, which could risk overheating the economy. Jason, what is your reaction to the new inflation numbers? And we're aware they're coming from last year when things were way down because of the pandemic. But let's be honest, prices are way up and people certainly feel it. Yeah. Look, last week we were talking about how jobs were way up. Today we're talking about how prices are way up. You know, to some degree, those are related. The United States had a huge, huge policy response to COVID. That policy response is creating jobs at a really rapid clip. Um, it's also contributing to this inflation. Yeah, some of this is supply side. Some of this is base effects. But we're seeing a lot more inflation in the United States than in Europe. That's because we did a lot more in response. Congressman, the White House argues that inflation is just short term. But with the midterms just over a year away, those short term effects could be devastating at the polls. How do you convince voters that Democrats have been good for their wallets? When you go to kitchen tables, all people are talking about are prices. Well, first to Jason's point, uh, it's, which I think was spot on, is people are back to work. And if you look at since we were during the height of the pandemic and where we are now, the good news is people are, are in jobs again. And, and I think we took smart bipartisan action, five bipartisan packages on COVID relief over the last 18 months, and it's working. You know, part of that, of course, is having its impact. And I think we need to be smart going forward. But if you look at what we did just yesterday on the bipartisan infrastructure package, Stephanie, Democrats and Republicans uh, coming together, including 19 Republican senators. And we're going to see uh, similar action in the House with uh, a bipartisan support for a infrastructure package. That's also key to our economic growth. And that's why it, that also was very smart policy. That means making sure that we can compete not only with China, but that we have roads, bridges, tunnels, water, all all the things that we need to actually grow our economy in the United States. And we get those shovels in the ground and people work there, 2 million jobs a year. All that's going to help move things forward. And that's how we're going to not only win as a country, but I think the Democrats will win strongly in, uh, in two years. But that's not the only thing Democrats are working on, immediately working on another three and a half trillion dollars of spending. Jason, I know you're not a politician, but you are part of the Obama White House. Is Biden's economic team rolling the dice on inflation to get infrastructure passed, or are they not worried about it at all? That extra three and a half trillion, that could crush us in terms of short-term inflation. I'm not worried about that package uh, in terms of inflation, Stephanie. Inflation is usually the Fed's job. Um, the Fed has been assigned by Congress the job of price stability. They should respond to the inflation numbers appropriately to achieve that goal. If you look at that reconciliation bill, you know, a bunch of that bill is paid for. It's spread out over time. Some of it will increase the productive capacity of the economy, for example, enabling more parents um, to work. So I think you should look at it and ask yourself, as a country, do we need preschool? Do we need paid leave? Do we need investments in education? If your answer is yes, um, then you should support that legislation. I would not worry about inflation for something like that. There's a ton of really good things in that human infrastructure plan. But Congressman, former President Trump, he was Mr. Real Estate. He said, I'm going to get infrastructure done. He didn't. Biden just did it in a big bipartisan way. 
Are Democrats risking losing this massive accomplishment on the one trillion dollar bill if you go too big with the three and a half trillion behind it? I think we should be voting right away on that infrastructure package in the House. Um, and, you know, I am concerned, uh, whereas I agree that a lot of the policies are critically important. I'm concerned about the size and scope of, of a reconciliation package. And I think we have to be cautious about that. Um, and, and there's a way to do this in the right way, in a targeted way. I'm concerned to make sure that uh, taxes don't go up uh, and, and that we handle this appropriately. And I think there's a way to do that. But it's going to take us working together uh, to make that happen. And you're right, Stephanie, let's let's take a big victory lap. Uh, not just Democrats, but Democrats and Republicans uh, for what got done yesterday in the Senate and what I'm hoping will get done very quickly in the House. Well, what does cautious mean? Because your caucus wants the standalone vote on the bipartisan bill. But when it comes to the three and a half trillion, we always point to Joe Manchin saying he's the guy. He doesn't want the other bill. He doesn't like that big price tag. And people often assume that Speaker Pelosi has got all Democrats in the House on board for the three and a half trillion. Are you, would you vote for it today? Well, you know, we, we have a three seat majority in the house and I've been talking to a lot of my colleagues and I think one, we need to see actually what's in it, the specifics, right? It's it's hard to say without seeing the details of what you're for or against. Um, on a, a macro perspective, there's lots of policies that Jason pointed to that I think are right um, in helping people. But I'm also concerned that that number is, a, is very aggressive. I'm concerned to make sure that we, if we do anything on the tax code that SALT comes back to help Jersey and make things more affordable here in the Northeast. And, and overall, the tax picture concerns me, and I want to look at that. But you know, the, we're, we're a long way away, Stephanie, and I think the key here is to be very smart and judicious how we do this. Uh, and, and this is not something we should jam through. And, and I've made my you know, opinion with several of my colleagues pretty clear about that. The, the best thing we can do right now is vote on that bipartisan infrastructure package that came out of the Senate, bring it to the House, the Problem Solvers Caucus, Work very closely with our bipartisan Senate colleagues to help get that done. And, you know, 20 percent of the GDP in the country runs through the Northeast. It's key that we actually have a tunnel that's not crumbling. It's key that we have uh, roads and rails that work. That's how we're going to stay competitive with China and globally and obviously how we're going to grow our economy at home. So let's t let's take that big win for the country. And, and obviously we can take other steps, too. But let's look at those separately. Trying to the naivete, the naivete of this congressman is astounding. First of all, uh, saying that because you've gotten 19 senators for a bipartisan bill makes it bipartisan is a joke. Based on the polls out there, we know that the Republicans in the Senate do not represent the will of their people when it comes to economic issues. And so is the case in the House as well. So trying to, to fight for a bipartisan deal uh, at all cost really means that you are not supporting most Americans. It's a fallacy that bipartisanship means what's best for America or what America say they want. Now, there are five points that I want to put out there. Numero uno. In the inflation number looks high because it is being compared with deflated prices one year ago. It's great that Stephanie Rule pointed that out right up front. It's important. But it, Americans won't notice that if you have liars on TV not telling what Stephanie Rule just said, which is, in fact, that if you're moving from a lower base, the inflation number looks high. There is some inflation, but it's not really 5.5 or 5.4 percent based on where the, the, the prices were pre-pandemic. Now, there was a, a point that should have been picked up. Europe did less. Europe doesn't have as much inflation as the United States because they did less. And you know why Europe did less? Because Europe has a built-in, most of the countries in Europe, or just about all of them, have a built-in safety net. They have all some form of Medicare for all. They all have some form of, of, of payment to employees not to work. So, I mean, they're not, uh, they're, they don't have the huge disparity among the kind of disparity that we have, even though they do have it as well. But at least the middle class and the poor are, for all practical purposes, able to maintain their dignity right now. Uh, if you look at Kingwood, where I'm at right now, there's somebody stuck in a hospital or rather in an emergency room because no hospital will take him because no, the insurance doesn't compute 
hospitals are full. And then, of course, this person likely went ahead and decided not to take the vaccine because you know who they are. So, I mean, let's be frank here. Europe is uh, less inflation because, again, they have a good safety net. Now, if the $3.5 trillion, uh, my third point, if the $3.5 trillion for things that we need and that are overdue will crush the economy, that tells you our economy is ineffective and our economy is wrong. Something that we've been preaching at Politics Done Right for a long time. We need to make very deep structural changes in this economy to ensure that it supports all as opposed to being what it has been very good for for the last 50 years. And that is transferring wealth from the poor and middle class to the wealthy. And when they talk about tax cuts, tax cuts, it always goes up the scale. Let's be frank. Let's be honest in the way we discuss this with people. Fourth item, a House Democrat saying they are concerned about raising taxes when those with capital are the least taxed is why Nancy Pelosi must not pass the bipartisan bill until the reconciliation bill is passed. Because the many of these crooks in our, our politicians, I'm sorry, many of these guys We'll go ahead and get that pass and say it's just enough. And hey, look at inflation. It's too high. Oh, look at that. We're going to have. No, what we need to do is make sure we have to hold them accountable to the poor. We have to hold them accountable to the middle class. And numero uh, cinco. A Democrat saying this is not something we should jam through is naive and shows weakness after the middle class and poor have been jammed for decades. So, folks, let's get real here. No bipartisan infrastructure bill until we get humanity taken care of, until we get that humane infrastructure bill that says, parents, we're going to help you take your chil- take care of your children so you can go to work. We understand that our economic system has been a shoe, a boot on your neck for decades. So now we're going to take care and make sure that we make a system that is not equal but it's more equitable and gives all equal access to success. Those who work get the spoils from their work. Those who are parasites and have been parasites for decades, it is time for you to pay. Today we have a special guest because it's someone that we normally wouldn't cover but you know what we believe in here in at Politics Done Right? We believe in listening to everybody. We also believe in everybody getting together. I'm honored to have Stephen Edward Broden. He's a former Republican political candidate from the state of Texas in the 30th Congressional District for the United States House of Representatives. Broden graduated from the University of Michigan with a bachelor and a master of arts degree in communication, and he later studied at the Dallas Theological Seminary, where he received a Master of Arts in Bible Studies. Broden advocates uh, in the Fair Park and South Dallas areas for economic opportunity, improved access to education, and against abortion. He is a spokesman for the uh, Black Pro-Lifer movement in Dallas. He's a founder of Ebony Berian, an organization whose mission includes informing African-American pastors of the culture war. Brother, Pastor S.E. Broden, welcome to Politics Done Right. Uh, It's my pleasure to be with you. I heard you're a bit under the weather, so that's the reason why we have you dancing around in the screen here. But uh, welcome to the show. Put yourself a little bit higher, if you will, for me, however, though. A little bit higher so that when I crop, you'll be fine. There you go. Okay. All right. All right, Pastor. How are you doing today? I'm I'm standing. I'm still standing. You're still standing. Okay, let me tell you something. Um what what intrigued me uh is that the from your from your agent I got this note that said the following. I have studied and researched and come to the conclusion that there is a deliberate attempt by the liberal left and progressive movement to use the black community as a hammer against the system. They have seduced the black community into supporting their agenda because they frame their agenda around issues important to us. 
They duped us and deceived us into supporting them. They used our black vote and power to seize power in the government, and they make pol policies to advance their agenda. We were duped, deceived, and manipulated into supporting them. They have never supported our <coughs> issues. Now, Pastor, uh, the danger of having of saying certain things is that when you're partially right, you're partially right. So I want to hear your point of view. Then I'd like to ask you a few questions about where we have some intersectionality here and where we have some divergence. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, I, I honestly believe after researching and studying and finding out the philosophy behind the Marxist and communist movement in America, mm -hmm. uh, the philosophers have made it clear. Uh, for example, uh, Saul Alinsky says, we organize the poor for power. Mm -hmm. Not not to help them in their issues, not to help make things better for their lives. We organize to get power. That's that's his um, scenario. And that's what he is uh, clearly articulating in what is called rules for radical. In addition to that, you have Cloward and Piven, who are philosophers as well out of Columbia University who created the idea of manufactured crises, creating crises using poor and demands of the poor in order to destroy the system, in order to bring the system down. So we have two of the philosophers who are primary prime movers in the uh, socialistic movement in America, mm -hmm. who have made it clear that they are moving among the poor for one reason, to get power. Then to couple that with Antonio Grimsey, who is the author of Cultural Marxism, who made it clear that the only way that we socialists are going to defeat the West is through infiltration and uh, gradualism, infiltration of every major institution out there so that they can control the lever of power. And so what they have done is use the black vote in order to get into position of power and then begin to make legislation and policies that undermine our Constitution, undermine our liberties. And so blacks have been um, complicit, albeit not always aware of the fact that we're being manipulated like this, but have been used by the left for the purpose of getting power. I lost and your then, picture. So could you put that back on? I want to answer that when you're done, but uh, could you get your picture back on for me, my friend? Okay. Uh, what's happening? I think is somebody's calling me. Uh, and what happens is that it flips over to the call. That That is fine. All right, right. Pastor. Let, let me first say that uh, I don't think you are completely wrong with the statement that you're saying at all. I think that is absolutely true that uh, what these guys are writing uh, with regards to how to acquire power and from whom and with whom to acquire power. My question to you is, um, what is really wrong with that? What is wrong with it? Yes. In oh, other words, well, any, let, let me any, back up. Any, mm -hmm. uh, any manipulation, any exploitation mm -hmm. of, of a people or a person or what have you is wrong. It's simply wrong. Okay. If, if I may fact, ask, if right. I may ask, um, I don't know if I, I don't call that exploitation. I call that empowerment, right? But I want to put it one one step further. Um, back in the, uh, you, you know who Lewis Powell is, right? The former Supreme Court justice that was appointed by, he's a former Democrat appointed by Richard Nixon to the Supreme Court. He actually designed a paper called the Powell Manifesto. If you don't know about it, it's okay. I, I'll ask you to trust me in what I'm going to say here uh, in that we're having an honest conversation. Okay. And that is the, the Powell Manifesto was designed by the Chamber of Commerce or was written by Lewis Powell to the Chamber of Commerce with the idea that we have to do the exact same things that you just said to ensure the continued empowerment of the business class. And if you haven't heard about it, I would ask you to go to my website or anywhere, just look up the Powell Memo or the Powell Manifesto. And that was the that was the way to acquire power. And the way they said they would do it is they would infiltrate the churches, then they'll infiltrate the media, they'll infiltrate the 
universities and all these other places, and they've success they've been successful in doing that. And uh, it is it is about a, a power, in my opinion, about a, a getting the power to effect change. And what you spoke about, Alinsky and Aslinsky and the others, uh, was to affect power for those who they believe are marginalized. Don't you think? Oh no, no. It uh, Saul Alinsky makes it very clear. He asked a group of his trainees. Mm-hmm. He says, "Why do we organize the poor?" Mm-hmm. And they came up with all kinds of laudable reasons of helping them and and trying to make things better for their lives. And mm-hmm. he screamed at them at the top of his voice. No, we organize for power. I, but I agree. We want power to affect change. Exactly. Not, not for the poor, but for their agenda and for their program, which is a socialistic paradigm to replace what we have here in America. Uh, let me ask you a question, sir. Let me, a, a real serious question. Um, I, I, I think we always have to be careful when we talk about what power is and what you can do with power. Let's, let's, let that, that socialistic agenda that we speak about, what does that entail? What do you think what it entails? It, uh, oh, I, I believe that uh, the first thing that we see is that it's going to expand government Mm-hmm. into our lives and be more controlling of every aspect of our lives. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, a, a contradiction to our whole way of, of life and the Constitution. You see, the Constitution was written to limit the government, not the people. Mm-hmm. The socialists, want to, they want to flip that and yes. they want to make it limit to the people and more expansive to the government. That's what the socialist paradigm is attempting to do. And you see something addition, wrong with that, sir? Yeah. In addition to that, here, here's what I believe where we're headed. And I, I think most of us don't consider this as we look at, at the kind of upheaval that's taking place in America today. There is a move, a deliberate move on the part of the power elite to do what is called a global reset. I'm sure you heard of the name Klaus Schwab, who is the president of the World Forum Economic uh, uh, system. Mm-hmm. He has announced very clearly that their goal is to reset the economy and reset the, the, the policies of the planet so that they can have uh, a whole new way of life and a whole new way of living based upon what they determine what is right and what is wrong. And socialism is the instrument for them to make that happen. So what we're seeing... And, and, we're hold on a second, sir. You just said socialism mm-hmm. is a method. What is socialism in your opinion? Socialism? Yes. It, it, socialism is, is an economic system. It's an economic system. Uh-huh. Uh, but in, in Antonio Grimsey's idea, it's more than an economic system. It is a um, cultural system. And uh, so there's two strands, if you will. One is economic, which is Karl Marx and his economic system, which seeks for a uh, a collective a, a conflict, a conflict between the the proletariat and the and the working class. I mean, mm-hmm. and the uh, and the masters uh, and the, the yes, yeah, they, uh, yeah. right. That, that's his. But Antonio said, no, it, it won't work. We can't do that. He says what we have to do is infiltrate their institutions and begin to change them from within Mm -hmm. based upon what the institutions do to influence them. Right. And number one on his list to get rid of is Christianity. He was looking to remove Christianity from the public square and and replace it with a human secularist idea that's sourced in Darwinism, Marxism, communism, socialism. All those isms were created by men who were God haters And so what we see is a system that is attempting to replace God and the influence of the Judeo-Christian ethic in America so that they can move us towards this global reset. All right. Let me ask you something, Pastor, because, uh, you know, I I think you use a lot of words, uh, communism, socialism, Marxism and all the isms. And you also say progressives or not progressive, but these people hate God. Uh, let me just uh, get a little personal here. I am a humanist. I don't believe in organized religion, but I know there is some supreme being. 
what I know is I'm humble enough to know that I don't know it all. Likewise, I don't, my wife is a deacon in a church. I don't know how uh, you'll feel about that, but <laughs> she, notice I said she is a deacon in a church. A lot of, a lot of churches, specifically black churches, don't like the idea of females as deacons in church. I don't know where you stand on that, but, you know, I have utmost respect and honor for her having accomplished that feat. Now, I don't hate God. I just don't believe the God that many of uh, many of the pastors put out as being God. The God that a lot of pastors put out, I think, seems too much like man. In other words, all the fealties that man have, they place that onto God. How can God be jealous? How can God be all these things? But let's go beyond that. Um, I hear you have a devotion to a constitution. That's what I hear in you. I hear you have a devotion to Judeo-Christianity. I hear you have a devotion to all these instruments, not socialism specifically, but these instruments that have, in my humble opinion, and you can correct me to your opinion if you will, have done much harm not only to Blacks specifically, but to minorities. and. Uh, I see it as a constitution that actually for quite some time supported genocide. So, I mean, our devotion to a, and I see capitalism myself as a, a form of indirected antiseptic slavery because there is no democracy in that. Uh, I would like you to refute that in, in, in the way you promote what you promote. I believe in the honor of people, I believe in everybody working for sustainability. But I, I think sometimes we get a diversion in beliefs based on inputs that I don't know where they, they emanated from. So your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I believe that the founding documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution have within it ideas mm -hmm. that uh, were the seed of making change and moving us as a nation into the right place where we needed to be. Those ideas were embedded in those documents. And so although we had a questionable start and there was a lot of uh, misrepresentation of the truth and, and all of that was probably true, but the seed for correction was in those documents. When we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men, when they wrote that, that included all men. Now, they probably didn't think like that, but the language said all men are created by God. I, certain I, I agree with you rights. there. Yeah. So what right. I'm saying is that principally mm -hmm. inside, it, inside those documents were the means by which corrections were made. Frederick Douglass, one of the incredible statesmen out of our community, was able to articulate and to represent those ideas in such a way that it won over even Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, and others who were listening to this man who was able to articulate those principles and move this nation in the right direction. So, yes. There are some issues there that were being done or exercised because men are corrupt and they're going to manipulate for their own benefit. But the principles were there enough for someone like a Frederick Douglass or someone like you could read those principles and say, this is where we ought to be and where we are is not where we should be based upon those principles. So I, I, I would submit to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is some some issues along the way. And and but uh, as I look at history, we made a lot of incredible corrections along the way. And it's undeniable. Well, I mean, I 
I, I can't I, I, look, I agree that we're not where we were back at the foundation, but anytime uh, there are compromises that need to be made that we were a compromise, I find it, it, it makes the document suspect that the document is mostly a property rights document. As you realize, only 5% of the people originally could vote in uh, during the, during the writing of the constitution. I, I think those things make it, what I think is the great thing about the Constitution is its elasticity, the ability to build on it. That's what I have always thought was good about the Constitution. Uh, absolutely. And the, and the Declaration of Independence. Well, Those no, principles. the Bill of Rights, the, the Bill yeah. of Rights, the Declaration of Independence. Anybody would have said what they've said, because, you, you know, I mean, remember, these guys, uh, these guys in other the British considered our founding fathers terrorists, right? Right. Correct. So that's one correct. person's liberator is one person's terrorist. Right. Correct. That, that, that's certainly how the, the Brits were looking at it. Exactly. I mean, but they, they were liberators. They were liberators here in America. I, I know, I know. But come on, they threw. Hey, man, they threw tea. They they created a terrorist act when they did all this stuff, you know. So I mean, we we have to understand, in my opinion, right? That that's how these things were created. Now, I want to get back on the subject, though. With with, um, but before you before you sure, move, go I, ahead, I, sir. I go wanna, ahead. I, sure. I do want to say that I don't want to take the the Declaration of Independence and set it aside. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to do that. I want to in, integrate it into all of the documents, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and the Declaration, because there's language and principles therein that set forth a course of action. If you listen to what it says, it says that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And to, in, to protect or secure these rights, Governments are instituted for the better welfare, right? For the welfare right. they, of they are instituted to protect and secure what rights? Those rights that God has given to us. But when government becomes destructive to that end, it is the right of the governed to alter or abolish it. Those are principles that still guide this nation today. Now, what what has government done, uh, and why? Who is government, by the way, sir? The people. We the, the people. people. We the right? people. We created it. Yes. Okay, so now if we elected a government, uh, we should abide by those that we elected. Correct. When they are consistent with the principles that are found within the founding document, when they come, when they contradict that, then we have a right to nullify uh, any of their decisions. And to remove them and replace them uh, with someone else. We always That's have that right. right. You're correct right. about that. We always have the right to orderly remove people from government. Or yes. to, to orderly, we, there's a method to remove them. Now, uh, the reason I said there's a method to remove them from government, if we decide as a gov if we the people decide as a government that we want a more progressive agenda, which most people say they want, by the way. And, and a progressive agenda, I don't know what, a lot of people look at a progressive agenda as some, you know, the, the way the right, many on the right, and I don't, I haven't seen a lot of your writings thus far, but many on the right have a tendency to, uh, to vilify the things that we stand for. And the things that I stand for are the things that I'm pretty sure you would stand for if, if, if I didn't give it a name. I mean, I stand for or, uh, I stand for things like uh, making sure everybody have a right to work. I stand for a everybody should have a living wage. I stand for people should have a say in their corporations. Well, I don't know if you stand for that one, but I do. Uh, so I don't I don't understand in your statement where you say we were we I said I look. The progressives in my opinion, where they fail is they don't go for, in, well, not progressive, the Democrats, not progressives, the Democrats, in my opinion, where they fail is that they're really not progressives. They're really in a lot of times aligned with what I call the corporatocracy. Your thoughts on that? Well, <laughs> I, I, you're, you're opening my eyes to, to an argument that I had not considered. However, I do believe that as I observe from where I sit, I see manipulation, 
I see uh, uh, exploitation mm-hmm. on the part of the Democrats and the socialists who are in bed with one another mm-hmm. to achieve an agenda. Now, here's why. Are you open to the? Re- Let me ask you. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Sorry, I usually don't do this, but I want we're we're having a very good conversation. Are you open to redefine what you think social uh, that socialism that so is so maligned on the right really is, as far as let's say those of us that consider ourselves democratic socialists really is. Are are you open to have a discussion where instead of the tropes that people use against somebody like myself, by the way, I'm an engineer, owned my own business for a long time, write software, not a moosh around the government or anything like that. Would you be open to uh, that, a a, a more rational interpretation of that? Well, I'll be open to any conversation. Um, You want to qualify it as rational, I think. Socialism is irrational. Tell me, but, oh, I, I, and that's where I want to explore, sir. What makes it irrational? Uh, because it robs the individual mm-hmm. of his God-given liberties, mm-hmm. those inalienable rights that Which are, are those, only, sir? Uh, are given by God: life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Socialism defines what that is. It, it shapes you and puts you in categories. And, and that's not where I think God would have us be. We ought to be able to develop our gifts and our talents and our, our capacity as far as it can take us. You know what is so interesting? Does not allow for that. I, I so agree with what you just said. And I, I, I agree with what you just said. The liberty, the pursuit of happiness, I believe all of that. And I believe our current system inhibits us from doing that. Let me give a a few examples. And and you tell me where I am wrong. Um, I I want everybody to have equal access, not, not, not equal access to success, but equal access to education so that they can be the best they can. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I also... I also agree that children are not responsible for having been born in poverty. Do you agree with that as well? I agree. Now, I then believe that we, the state who depend on having a successful population, should support these kids in a manner to give them that that equal access to success. Do you agree with that? Well, certainly. Absolutely. And, and that's what I'm saying, Pastor. Right. I find so much intersectionality in what we want and find that it's the external tropes that put us against each other. Let me ask you one other thing. You're here in Texas from what I read. And we decided in Texas for ideological reasons not to accept the Medicaid expansion to the Affordable Care. You are a pastor. You care about humanity. You care about your pew. Here's what always concerned me, and it it concerned me with a lot of religious folks. Whether you agree with the policy or not, if you can save 2,500 Texas lives until you are able to mold that policy that can continue to keep lives afloat, until then, wouldn't you do it? As a pastor, sir. Well, I mean, that's, that's a, an interesting question. I, I happen to believe that the systems that we have in place today mm-hmm. work very well to help people who are indigent and poor through the county systems, through the monies and, uh, that we have made available to help people who are indigents. Mm-hmm. That system is that na- net, that safety net is in place. We need to reinforce it. We need to make sure that it's up and running and doing the job that we designed for it to do rather than taking and usurping from us our right of choice, Mm -hmm. our right of decisions. I I just I, I just find that there is a better way of doing it and that the truth of the matter is we had a system in place. And that we needed to tweak on it. No, no question about it. We need to tweak it. But it's there. It's in place. And it was a safety net. Pastor, with all due respect, Pastor, and you right. know uh, that that's all I, 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 
you know, with all due respect, that is not true. From talking from a person who has a wife with lupus, talking for somebody who was a businessman, who is a businessman, but who had to pay his own health care out of, I mean, my, I've never been uninsured. Good because, like I said, I had my own company, but what I had to pay, the average Texas citizen could not afford, and the safety net did not address the average Texas citizen who couldn't have health care until they went to an emergency room to be patched up and sent home. Let me tell you what I believe, and you tell me what's wrong with this or what makes your life more difficult for me wanting this. Uh, when you have a private health care plan, a, a private insurance plan, your, doc, your, your health care plan that you can afford tells you what medicines you can have, what doctors you can see, and all these issues are de de determined to you based on your particular insurance company and how much profit they will make. That's decided by somebody you didn't vote for, just a plan you were able to afford to purchase. Medicare for all, a national system says, we want a baseline coverage for every American citizen because there's not a profit motive, because we don't have to pay 100% to that salesperson the first year who sells that policy. All that money goes into health care. Um, I, I, who pays some, for that? Wait, who we all do. That? We all do. The government does, doesn't it? No, 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 no. We do. We do. Every taxpayer including those who would not have normally purchased health insurance. They pay because it comes out of the general fund that we all fund. And the one difference is that we don't have to have multiple databases, multiple advertising. We don't have to have any of those things. So those costs are not there. For ideological reasons, and, and this is where I would like to see a split even on the right, where you can say, I don't, I, I don't believe in telling a woman what to do. You do for, uh, for abortion, et cetera. But that, doesn't, that, shouldn't, uh, def, that shouldn't prevent you and I from working together to ensure that our people, and when I say our people, I'm not talking black people. I'm talking about all people can have good health care, good basic health care. And what we have now isn't that. Oh, you're disappearing, my friend. Yeah. Your thoughts on that, sir? I um, I wasn't prepared to talk to you about these issues, but uh, and they are are provoking. And um, well, you, if, if I don't I, want to I put you on the spot, you, if you'd you, like to, I can tell you this: yeah. that I, I I I err on the side of competition. Mm -hmm. I err on the side of of individual rights, mm -hmm. and that, that's where I would stand on that issue. I would like but to ask you a favor, Pastor, and I really, I'm saying this from the depths of my heart. I'd like for you to consider some of the wording that I've said there when it comes to profit motive, et cetera, and whether there are certain things that don't belong in the competitive field. I mean, I am, as an engineer, I didn't need competition to want to invent the things that I invented. And my stuff is on the space station. It's used by Boeing, et cetera. I didn't need to think about money for that. Those of us who innovate, actually innovate. And then some capitalist comes and take our innovation and makes money off of it. That's how our system works. So I'd like to ask you, as you preach to your pew, et cetera, to consider some of those things and tell, come back to, and talk to me about that later on. Because there is a whole lot of information that's going, to, going out there to, or to not, on, not only Black folk, but to a lot of folks that turns people like me who wants what's good for people as well into a boogie person as opposed to you and I working together and saying we can actually make a difference. Let me tell you why I wanted to talk to you because of the work you're doing and the involvement that you're doing in, in South Dallas. So I mean, if, if there are some, some intersectionalities that can come out of helping people, that's what I actually believe in. Well, it's good that we, we've come back to that. Um, I believe that intersectionality, liberation theology, critical theory, critical race theory, mm -hmm. all of these things are instruments in what I call the toolbox of the left, mm -hmm. the foment, the, the chaos, the foment division, 
and to create uh, the kind of chaos that we see right now in America, mm. that a 20,000 foot view will look at each one of those elements and recognize that it is a instrument in the hands of the Democrats and social um, socialists mm -hmm. to create chaos and confusion in our nation. And you cannot deny that we are a nation that is divided and a nation that is at each other's throat. And the instruments through which that is happening is intersectionality, critical race theory, critical theory, liberation theology, mm -hmm. and the cancel culture. All of it is working. Uh, by the way, you know, confusion. The, the cancel culture can be problematic. I do agree with that. Um, the, the critical race theory, I don't understand the issue there, to be frank, because it's not something that's I, I want Americans to all know our genesis, because I think if we don't know our genesis, we are, we're liable to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. When it comes to intersectionality, I don't see how one would see that as the left. Look, I am not saying all the people on the left are pure. I know I, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> I want to work with people and I want things better. So I think it's sort of a I, I think you're putting, let's say, folks like me in a box by saying that because I want intersectionality with people, with you, with your pew, et cetera, that somehow I'm trying to create chaos. You know, it's not. Uh, no, well, I wouldn't say that you are necessarily, but the philosophy behind the the idea. And that's where I would have you go and look. What is the reason? What is the philosophy that drives the concept? And, and you cannot, I think, be fair to the process if you don't understand what it is and but why it is. Pastor, I do understand. And there's other things that I understand. We're, we're folks like you and I can discuss a whole lot of things on these levels. Let's say talking about Shalinsky and all these other people. Uh, most people can't or not can't. Most people don't. And that's not where they're at. And they're just most of us in this movement who just want to do right. I, I, I think uh, I, I, we're going to have to shut this down pretty soon, but I'm, I'm enjoying this. Uh, I want to say that I think we have to get away from the stereotypes and the wordiology that I heard you use, because uh, if, if I were to look at what, okay, you, you, you say what socialists want to do, all socialists, a socialist, a real socialist would look at you and say, I want one person, one vote and us deciding on things. And, and a capitalist will tell, I mean, let me be honest with you. I see capitalism as a form of slavery. Let me stop uh, you, you, your, your eyes open. And I say, I say, I say, well, you know, how can I invent something? And uh, after I invent something and have people work for me, we do all the work. And, you know, you're, there are some people who would say, I want my money to work for me. Nobody's money works for them. Nobody's money works for them. I work for money and the money you didn't pay me is the profit that you make sitting down at your pool if you own stocks. Right. Isn't that true? OK. So my, my point is. Uh, the, the, the type of the type of a, the type of attacks I see that people make on, let's say, those who believe in one person, one vote, uh, social, uh, a social structure where you all have input. I think it, it sometimes it can be a bit misguided because when you look at where the faults really lie in this country, the faults really lie in the capital class who really use everybody else as just a source of labor. We just learned how to do it better than slavery now. Well, of the two systems, I think the capitalist system is the one that affords opportunity for someone you, like you. No, no, someone no. Someone like not you true. to start no. your own business, mm -mm. to create as you have created and have made some money on that and have done pretty well for yourself. I've been chosen. I, I, I've been I chosen. Think, right. Well, I don't think under a socialistic paradigm that opportunity would have existed for you. Well, um, what in the social paradigm would have stopped that from happening? The expansion 
and regulation of government on the individual. Um, what I we believe- can and cannot do. I, I think and, and we see that and we see a bit of that now when they are shutting down churches and telling churches that they cannot uh, gather for fellowship or to pray for one another or to sing. And they shut the churches down. What is that? Don't that's, you see the reason why they shut all, everything no, that, down? I, I think that that is an individual choice. It's my body is my choice. You don't tell me what to do with my body. I. I agree with that. As long as what you do with your body doesn't affect my body. Right. Right. And so that means if I'm doing something that you think has an adverse impact on you, you don't come around. I can deal with that. I could honestly deal with that. Unfortunately, most of the people that think that way don't. But Pastor uh, uh, S. Broden, let me tell you. I would like to entertain. I'd like to ask you to come back on the show. I'd like to ask you to come back on the show the next time, mostly to talk about uh, two issues, specifically Medicare for all and basic income, which I think you disagree with them both. And the reason why is this is something that I think is important for your particular community. You bet. Uh, we've been with uh, Pastor S.E. Broden. I really appreciate you coming on Politics Done Right. Um, please do come back. You bet. Once again, remember, you can get Politics Done Right Mondays through Fridays on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash politics done right or on YouTube Live at politics done right.com slash YouTube. Please do not forget to follow me on Twitter for updates. My handle is at Egberto Willis at E G B E R T O W I L L. IES. Remember, we have great offers for you. This is Fun Drive Month. So please go ahead and get, as I see it, Class Warfare, the only resort to right wing doom, and offer a contribution of $120. It's worth it. How to get, how to talk to your right wing relatives, friends, and neighbors. Contribution, $120. How to make America utopia. Take away the economy from those who rigged it. Contribution, $120. You can get two books. For a contribution of $200, three books for the contribution of $250. Again, please remember this is your community radio station, KPFT. Keep KPFT in your minds. Talk about it. Tell your friends about it. Tell them to tune into KPFT 90.1 FM Houston. KPFT.org is where you can make your pledges or, or listen to us or call 713-526-5738. Remember, folks, you are the ones that will not only keep us alive, but keep these independent movements viable. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this, baby. I am what? Out. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.